So in any event, I need to leave immediately after this because British Airways has told me that they've mastered many technologies, but uh, baggage delivery is not one of them, and I need to be home by 5 o'clock when the magic call will come. So my bags are on. <laughs> I came in yesterday from Belgium. My bags are coming on one flight this afternoon. My wife is on another. It sounds like some kind of a bad joke. Um, in, a, in a session in the Silicon Valley on power, um, many, or in a session on power today, I've taught a class on power for many decades, actually, and we all have come to understand that we live in a new world. Many of my students say, you know, you remind me of some 15th century prince uh, or author who wrote about a prince, uh, which is probably true. There are days in which I feel about that old. Um, and, uh, but, but we have new power for new times. You know, we're in the Silicon Valley, we're all high tech people. Uh, we have new communication technologies, hierarchies dead, uh, racism and sexism is dead. Uh, we live in a world of, you know, some postmodernist paradise. And uh, there's a lot of talk, as there was, and I think it's very appropriate talk, about empowerment and about building strong organizational cultures and about building a world in which people, like, you know, love each other and all kinds of other good things. And then, of course, you wake up in the morning and if you are a sentient human being, you look at the news and you see that the world that we are, that we believe we're living in bears no, very little resemblance uh, to the world, in fact, that we are living in. And so what I would like to do in a very brief period of time is explain to you the realities of power. I wish they weren't true. Many, I gave a talk, actually, I guess it was less than two nights ago, in Brussels, and one of my, one of the people at the talk said, this sounds very depressing. And I said, actually, it depends upon what you think is depressing. What I find depressing, uh, to be brutally honest, is the following. Much to, I think, people's surprise and astonishment, a significant fraction of Stanford MBAs, these are Stanford MBAs, not Cal MBAs, Stanford MBAs, <laughs> smart, wonderfully well-trained people, a significant fraction. The number is not precise because nobody gathers data on this, but a significant fraction, some people will tell you as high as 20%, will lose their first job within two years because they will get fired. Depending upon the data that you look at, somewhere between 25 and 70% of otherwise successful executives will suffer during the course of their career what is euphemistically by the Center of Creative Leadership called a career derailment. Many of you understand a career derailment for what, the, for what it actually is, which is getting fired. I find those statistics depressing. This morning, having flown back yesterday, I guess, I had the privilege of addressing a group of young Asian leaders, emerging leaders. The program for Asian Emerging Leaders, which is sponsored by a company that I shouldn't mention since they happen to be a competitor for Shell, is worried about developing their Asian leaders because just as in the case of women, for, Asian, for Asians or Asian Americans, as for women, at the very bottom levels where you look at, you know, where, where careers are basically based upon individual performance, individual success, and intelligence and motivation and such as that, no problem. The higher you go, the smaller the numbers. So the promotion of diversity is an issue not just for women, which it clearly is, and if you look at the catalyst data, it is completely flat over the, basically over the last 15 years, and this is true in law firms, and it's true around the world. So I give a talk to them, and I find it depressing that in 2013, approaching 2014, we still have work organizations in which there is career derailment, in which people are not getting ahead, particularly women and minorities, including Asian Americans and including, of course, African Americans. I find it depressing that a significant fraction of my Stanford students, hopefully not my students, but actually they don't always learn the lessons either, find themselves in career problems. And the reason why all of these things come to be true is mostly because people don't understand the reality of power dynamics. So I'm going to explain to you the reality of power dynamics. And also, 
give you my perspective on why they are relatively constant both across cu cultures and over time and why nothing ever changes. Number one, first fact of life. Contrary to what you may have read, hierarchy still exists. To the best of my knowledge, there's only one president, and it's not Marco Rubio <laughs> or Ted Cruz, at least yet. <laughs> there is one president. There is one CEO of every, com of every company. In companies which have tried shared governance, seldom last very long. One school superintendent, one mayor, one governor. Hierarchy exists. Hierarchy exists among animals. Our dear friend Jim Collins gave me a book called Chimpanzee Politics. You can picture what that's about. <laughs> hierarchy exists. And by the way, hierarchy is chosen. According to research by my colleague Laura Tetons, when you give people who are, a, a who are assigned to accomplish a task a choice of organizing arrangements, they pick hierarchy. So hierarchy's here. It's not going away. We would like to hope that it's going away. It hasn't. It isn't. It probably isn't going to. The second fact, as long as there's hierarchy, most people would prefer to be nearer the top than the bottom. Number, if, in case you haven't been reading the news, people at the top make more money than the people at the bottom. But something that you may not know about, according to research by Sir Michael Marmot, famous British epidemiologist, knighted by the Queen, written in a book called The Status Syndrome, it turns out that people at the top live longer. Literally. Power is related to lifespan, which if you think about it makes, of course, perfect sense. Because you know what they say, something flows downhill, and you would rather be the flower than the flowee. <laughs> Power gives you control over your life, and therefore you live longer. So now, number one, hierarchy exists. Number two, people would prefer to be higher status rather than lower status, which of course follows and makes sense. Third. People say, well, OK, it's fine that hierarchy exists and that there is competition. Isn't competition decided on the basis of the merits? Well, everybody knows that isn't true. This year, the Oakland Athletics have done it again. With the fourth smallest payroll in baseball, the Oakland Athletics have won their division. How did they do this? Well, if, in fact, rewards in baseball were perfectly correlated with merit, it would be impossible for the Oakland Athletics to exploit what is essentially a market imperfection and put together a winning team out of a set of people who are not being paid their full market value. What is true in baseball is certainly true in other domains as well. The race doesn't always go to the smartest or to the fastest. The race goes to the people who, in fact, can win the race. And those skills require many other things. Now, turns out there are two fundamental dimensions by which we evaluate human beings. And research shows that this is true actually across cultures. People immediately evaluate others on the basis of warmth, likability, if you will, and competence. The paradox is as follows. Even though I'm sure everybody in this room is both warm and competent, empirically, people tend to see warmth and competence as being negatively related. So to put it simply, you can look at Amy J.C. Cuddy, a famous social psychologist at, Harvard, at Harvard's article, nicely summarized by its title, just because I'm nice, don't assume I'm dumb. Or Teresa Amabile's article, Brilliant But Cruel. We assume competence. If you're, if you're nice, it must be because you're not too competent, which is unfortunate, but it is, in fact, it is in fact the case. Or to quote the Israeli, now deceased Israeli Prime Minister Golda Meir, and one of the most profound sayings I have ever heard, and you should think about this for a long time, because the more you think about it, the more meaning there is to it. Don't be so modest, you're not that good. <laughs> think about that. 
Because we assume competency and warmth are negatively related, it is in case, even though my friend jo Bob Sutton made a fortune writing his famous book, which I'm sure many of you read, and if you were unfortunate, had somebody give to you anonymously, the no asshole rule, he of course had to put in a chapter, which I insisted, called The Virtue of Assholes. <laughs> and he did, of course, his famous Google search, which is to pair the word asshole with the names of a bunch of CEOs, <laughs> to see who came out on top, and you can guess who it was, who won by four times uh, the, the number of, of number two on the list. So warmth and competence. Warmth and competence implies that you need to, uh, to, to make some trade-offs about life. Um, and sometimes you need to be competent rather than warm. We'll talk more about that in a second. Next, most fundamentally, if I said to you, I can give you one principle. One principle by which you could understand all of human behavior. And it's one principle. And that principle is called, and we're going to give you that principle and many derivations from it. The principle is that people like to think good of, of themselves. The idea is self-enhancement. We are motivated to think positively about ourselves. We self-enhance. Now the manifestations of this are many. One manifestation of self-enhancement is what is called in the literature the above average effect. And the above average effect is just this. Take a random sample of any, of any set of human beings, including the people in this room, and ask them anonymously to respond to the question, are you above average in any positive attribute? Are you above average in height, intelligence, sense of humor, vocal ability, writing ability, income? It turns out more than half of the people will say that they're above average. Because, of course, we like to think of ourselves as above average. Since we like to think well of ourselves, there's another consequence. We love people who remind us of our favorite person, who is, of course, ourselves. If you do a Google search on the New York Times website, which I guess is a contradiction in terms, if you go to the New York Times website and search using the exact phrase, within quotes, you remind me of me, you will see a very nicely written, summary of the research that, that demonstrates the most powerful and effective way to get people to like you and to, get, and to influence others is, of course, to imitate them, literally. Stanford Virtual Reality Lab has actually done things where they have avatars that, that imitate with a four-second delay, because it turns out if you do it immediately, the people know you're imitating them. But if you imitate them with a four-second delay, it turns out that the avatars that imitate with a four-second delay, not three, not six, four, are more liked than the, and, and we're talking about motions, gestures, all the things I'm doing up here now. It turns out if you do that with a four-second delay, I will like you. You remind me of me. We like things that remind us of ourselves. Research shows, believe it or not, that you are more likely to marry someone with the same initials. You are more likely to choose an occupation whose name reminds you of you, and the search of dead death records have shown that people are more likely than chance to die in cities whose names are similar, or states whose names are similar to their own. But to give you an example that you will immediately relate to, since everybody in this room knows one date perfectly, which is, of course, your birthday, it turns out the easiest birthdays for you to remember are the birthdays that are close of your friends and colleagues that are close in absolute value to your own. So if you want to remember your friend's birthdays, have friends that his birthdays are close to yours. We like things that remind us of ourselves. That's part of self-enhancement. The next part of self-enhancement, of course, is since we like to think well of ourselves and we like to think of ourselves as successful, we love to associate with winners and distance ourselves from losers. And we know this. There is the famous Basking and Reflected Glory study. Basking and Reflected Glory. Every spring, I go to Barcelona to teach for the Biz Spanish Business School ESA. And every spring, I, we arrive at the same time, about the second week in May. And the second week of May, for those of you who don't follow soccer, is about when the Champions League series is winding down. And every year, once we arrive, I can tell within the first probably three hours how well 
Barca, Barcelona, the soccer team, Lionel Messi, their big star, is doing. And you can tell by looking on the streets to see what percentage of the people are wearing Barca colors. The Basking and Reflected Glory study did the following. You can do this yourself. Used to be, not anymore, football was played only on Saturday. Do the following study. Look at the percentage of people wearing merchandise that you can see. We're not talking thongs or underwear. We're talking visible merchandise, such as sweatshirts, t-shirts, shorts, socks, whatever. What percentage of people in a class or in a common area on a campus are wearing school insignia merchandise on a Monday following a victory versus a Monday following a defeat? And it turns out you can predict the result, even though the people wearing that merchandise have had nothing to do with this team's success. People love to bask in reflected glory. If somebody said to me, the best thing for the sale of Stanford merchandise in the history of the world was Andrew Luck. We had Andrew Luck, we went to the bowl games, Stanford merchandise soars. There are all kinds of people wearing Stanford insignia stuff. By the way, Stanford guards its logo and its color very, very, caref very carefully. Because we love to be associated with winners, we will put up with people who don't behave perfectly. When you, you, may, you may know the name George Steinbrenner, owner of the New York Yankees. Not on anybody's list of best bosses. That's for sure. When George Steinbrenner died, one of the things that it talked about in his obituary was his famous case of firing Billy Martin, the manager, five times. In order to be fired by George Steinbrenner five times, there is something that has to be true by definition, which means you have to go back four. Now, if you are good enough to manage the New York Yankees, let me suggest it has to be the case that you are probably good enough to manage another team. So why would Billy Martin voluntarily go back five times to be fired by George Steinbrenner, master of the tirade, tyrant, whatever? The New York Yankees have won 27 world championships. The New York Yankees play in New York. The New York Yankees have an unlimited budget, which they often overspend. It turns out, it turns out that people will put up with a lot. I had a fellow in my executive program some years ago who described what it was to be steved. The adjective of the man who, of course, scores number one on Bob Sutton's test. What is it to be steved? Fired in the morning told I was the stupidest piece of whatever that ever existed. I'm packing up my stuff. He came by in the afternoon. He said, what are you doing? He said, you fired me. He said, well, I didn't, I didn't really mean it. Why would people put up with that? To be associated with a successful organization. People will put up a lot with a lot to be associated with power and success. So I tell people all the time, it is nice to be likable. Likeability will, will, can bring power. But it is almost certainly the case that once you have power, you will have tons of friends. People will love you. You'll have lots of people liking you. Because we want to be associated with success. It is ingrained in us. We have, we have learned probably on the savanna of thousands and hundreds of thousands of years ago two skills. To distinguish friend from foe, us versus them, and to distinguish who's going to win. Because that's how your genetic material gets, in fact, reproduced and perpetuated to be able to make those two very simple distinctions. So we love to bask in reflected glory, which means that once you have power, you um, will associate with it. Um, now, two other things, then we'll open this up for questions. Again, this is not to depress you, to teach you kind of like the rules of life. You can actually use them quite successfully. People will forgive. Because we love to be associated with success, when successful people do heinous acts, they are often, believe it or not, forgiven. So people say, you know, how do people get away with stuff? It's actually quite easy. When people are, once people become rich and successful, they can get away with all kinds of things. I'll give you many examples. Here's one of my favorite. New York Magazine. Not the New York Times, not the New Yorker, New York Magazine. 
If you go to the New York Magazine website and do a search under the name Martha Stewart, you will see a fabulous article. It's only three pages. It's fabulous on Martha Stewart. Yes, this is Martha Stewart. Martha Stewart, convicted felon. Yes. Martha Stewart, corporate adulterer. Started with Kmart, thought she was exclusive with Macy's, then, then fooling around with J.C. Penney. Macy's is suing her. That Martha Stewart. Martha Stewart, who according to this article in New York Magazine, who I assume they know this, has a brand name that has never been worth more money. Believe it or not. People forgive her. In the Silicon Valley, we forgive all kinds of things. People in the Silicon Valley, of course, have no sense of history. You should go back and read David Kaplan's famous book, The Silicon Boys. You can read about a company called DRI. Does anybody in this room remember DRI? <laughs> you were there. Congratulations. So you know that DRI is the company that actually invented the operating system that made Microsoft famous, made Microsoft wealthy. Doc documented. Document. We forgive all kinds of things. One of my favorite lines from the Silicon Boys is about, of course, Larry Ellison. Operates in a business called software. Software. Software is an industry which has the term associated with it, vaporware. What is vaporware? It is, of course, selling software that you don't yet have. So one of the wonderful quotes in the Silicon Boys is, is David Kaplan asks Larry, one of Larry Ellison's co-founders of Oracle, does Larry lie? And the answer is, no, we don't think Larry lies. We just say he has a problem with tenses. <laughs> As in, is this software available? The answer, yes, may mean now that you've asked about it, it could be. <laughs> Steve Jobs, associated with a famous phrase that we have forgotten, reality distortion field. The phrase made up by Andy Hirschfeld, who worked on the Macintosh team. And the nice thing about reality distortion and some of the stuff is that actually Things become true. If everybody thinks Apple has the coolest, I've, uh, the iPhone is the coolest product, people line up in the stores, it becomes the coolest product, everybody says, oh my goodness, I need to have one, then you buy it. The self-fulfilling prophecy truly, truly works. But people are forgiven. It's amazing. We don't believe people are forgiven, but people are forgiven. So that would be another thing you need to think about. Let me see if there's anything else I wanted to say. Nope. That's it. So let me end, according to this little thing clicking off here, I have four minutes and 17 seconds, which is very good. That would give me four minutes for questions, because uh, I'll give you 17 seconds of summary. The summary is, is that the study of human behavior is, I believe, not depressing at all. I think what is depressing is that we, in the leadership literature, which is a book I thought I wasn't working on, I'm actually writing three books, but the least priority book got finished first because it motivated me the most. We live, in a, we live in a world in which we, we basically tell ourselves nice stories. We tell ourselves stories. They aren't true, but they're nice. Stories about heroes, mythology. You know, I tell people all the time, I, wonderful story. I'm sitting at a closing dinner for this executive program in Barcelona, and a guy comes over to me, a little drunk. It's the evening. It's Barcelona. He was a student in my program. He says, he says, I'm disappointed in you. I said, many people are. <laughs> it's OK. He said, I'm disappointed in you. I said, what in particular disappointed you? He says, I want to be inspired. Oh, I like that. I said, he said, he said, you, I said, well, you know, I try to teach you about social science, the reality of human behavior, the dynamics of power. He said, I want to be inspired. I said, fine. Go to the Picasso Museum. Go listen to a great symphony. Go listen to, to great opera. We, in the management education business, have, I think, mistakenly believed that it is our job to inspire people as opposed to tell them the truth. If you search under the Google phrase, within quotes, you can't handle the truth, <laughs> you will, of course, see my favorite movie scene, Tom Cruise and Jack Nicholson from A Few Good Men. I actually believe that A Few Good Men. 
I believe that not only can you handle the truth, but that we are much better off understanding the real dynamics of human behavior. I am tired of having co-founders forced out of their organizations, founders forced out, people's careers ruined because they believed that the world was something other than the principles by which we know is true. So to me, it's very depressing when you know I have all these sad stories, which I have, by the way, plenty of, but I have now one minute and 52 seconds left, and we do need to end on time. I will take questions on anything I've discussed or anything else, and then I will go see if I can find either my wife or my suitcase. <laughs> Not, by the way, in that order, but in any event, and they are on different fly, and they are on different flights. Yes, sir. Yeah, hi, uh, John Grundy. My question was about uh, bending the rules. So a lot of power in an organization tends to come from bending the rules. You quoted things of you know Larry bending the rules about what it means to have software ready. Can you talk a little bit more about you know how that manifests itself? Sure. So bending the rules. So I'll give you you know I'm gonna give you a quick answer because I want to take more questions. There is a fabulous article in the New Yorker magazine written by the famous business author Malcolm Gladwell. And the title of the article is How David Beats Goliath. And basically, we understand how David beats Goliath. David beats Goliath by basically breaking the rules. The rules of combat were you put on armor, you put on a sword. David isn't going to win that way. Studies have been done of armies. Armies, you can measure relative strength. When the, when the weaker force plays by the rules of the stronger force, the weaker force loses most of the time. When the weaker force, think Lawrence of Arabia, think Al Qaeda, think asymmetric warfare in general, when the, when the weaker force makes up its own rules, does something, doesn't play by the rules, they win actually two-thirds of the time. So Malcolm Gladwell's point, which I think is exactly right, is he said the rules tend to be made by the people who are favored by the rules. So what I tell people is, if the rules, if you're winning with the rules, bless you. If you're not winning by the rules, you know, there used to be a billion years ago a um, guy who's now a Buddhist humorist Scoop Wes Nisker still does shows. Scoop Nisker used to do a radio newscast on some rock radio station probably now three decades ago. And he used, to, he used to end his newscast with a wonderful phrase, if you don't like the news, go out and make some of your own. And that is, I think, a wonderful idea. If you don't like the rules, go out and make your own, if you're now winning by the car. And by the way, if you think about business success, Virtually every business success story is, uh, is by companies that broke in quotes the rules for its industry. Apple invented products that didn't look like they should have looked. Whole Foods Markets doesn't operate like a normal grocery store. Southwest Airlines doesn't operate like a normal airline. I mean, basically in every industry, uh, companies are continually uh, reinventing their rules. That's a great question. But I highly recommend looking at Malcolm Gladwell's article, When David Beats Goliath. In The New Yorker, I think it's probably 2009. Are we out of time for questions? We are. In that case, I hope, you know, I don't live that far away, even though I seldom see all of, all of you. Come look me up. Stanford, we have a great eating facility on campus. Uh, and who knows, I may run into you on some flight or running through Heathrow Airport. Thank you very much. <laughs>